Hello and welcome to our first ever online CPD talk. Due to COVID, we're going to be trialling uploading CPD talks onto YouTube. This YouTube channel will have not only our uploaded CPD talks, but also other YouTube videos that we think might be beneficial for you to watch. Once you've completed a CPD talk, if you do a reflection and hand this in to the member of staff that has given the talk, then you can get a CPD certificate for it. This particular presentation has an exercise to complete alongside it. The exercise sheet number and the presentation number can both be found in the information box below so that you can go and get them off of QPulse to be able to complete. When it comes to the time to complete the exercise sheet, there will be a screen that comes up. If you pause the video, go and complete it, and then we're going to go through the answers here in this presentation. So. This particular CPD talk is about the different agglutination technologies used in pre-transfusion testing. In the presentation, we're going to do a quick overview on agglutination, the different technologies that are currently available. Then there'll be a chance for you to complete a question sheet. We'll go through the pros and cons together um, and obviously the answers to the question sheet. If you do have any feedback or questions relating to this talk, please feel free to email myself um, or contact another member of your senior team to discuss with them. When we go through this talk, I want you to keep in mind what you could see as being the pros and cons of each of these technologies to discuss later on. See if you can come up with any that maybe I don't come up with by the end. So, starting up with an overview of agglutination. So, agglutination occurs as a result of antibody antigen reaction. This is a specific chemical interaction between antibodies produced by B cells. In relation to transfusion, what happens is each person has specific antigens on their red blood cells. When they are exposed to red blood cells from a foreign entity, so be that via transfusion or through pregnancy, they create antibodies that correspond to these antigens. These will then bind to those red blood cells causing agglutination as you can see here. The agglutination is what we look for in all of our testing and it's how we can tell whether or not there is an antibody or antigen present. So if we were looking to find out whether a patient had a red cell antigen present, then what we would do is we would use an antisera containing a known antibody and look for any agglutination. The same is applicable in the reverse. So if we're looking to see whether or not a patient has a specific antibody, then we will use reagent red cells that have specific antigens on them and again look for agglutination. Different technologies will do this in a different way and that's what we're going to go through. So currently, there are four main techniques in use within blood transfusion. These are column agglutination technology, which is broken down into a further two. So you've got gel column technology and glass beads technology, solid phase technology or plate technology, and hemagglutination technology, or most commonly known as tube grouping. Each of these are pros and cons. Um, and it's very important that you are at least aware of them in case you do have an analyzer change and make it a lot easier for you to be able to read the results. So we're going to start off with column agglutination technology and specifically gel column agglutination technology. Currently in the hospitals, we are both using gel column agglutination technology. In this technology, you get a card this card will be specific to what test you're doing. So if you're doing the ABO grouping, then you will get a card which has reagents for ABO. Um, so it has the anti sera in the card, and then it will add in a reagent with red cells on it. This is because generally the stability of the red cells is not good enough to keep it within the card. So the cards will have microtubules in. Again, they'll each have a different reagent in. And Within those microtubules, there is a dextrin acrylamide gel, which contains anti-IgG. 
this gel acts as a filter for agglutinates. So what happens is you will add in the patient's red cells or plasma and the reagent needed. That will go in the top of the microtubule. This will be incubated if required and then spun down. As it's spun, it is pushed down into the gel. If there has been a reaction and there is a glutination there, it won't be able to pass through that gel. So you will end up with a line at the top of the microtubule. If there is some agglutination, but it's not really strong, then some of that will be able to break away and pass partially through the gel. If there's no agglutination, then it will be small enough to go to the bottom of that column. And that's how we would be able to tell whether it's a positive or a negative reaction. An example of this you can see here. So with the A, you've got a strongly positive reaction. We would grade that as a 4+. plus. The B, there was no reaction, so that's dropped to the bottom. Um, the one here that is not a strong reaction, you can see there is a reaction in the A1. So you can see that although it has a line at the top, it started to fall down and there is actually a line at the bottom. So this could be interpreted as a dual population result, which is really important that with this technology, you're able to see that. So if you have more than one population of red blood cells, so say you've had a patient that's been transfused, you can pick up the results from the transfused red blood cells and the patient's red blood cells. And that's why you end up with the two populations. Here it will be an unexpected result anyway, so we'd need to investigate it, but we're not going to go into that today. Now if we continue with column agglutination technology, you go into glass bead technology. The main company that uses this is Ortho. Glass beads and the gel-based technologies look pretty much the same. The difference is instead of using a gel, there are lots of small glass beads that act as a filter. So again, you would end up with a similar result. If there's agglutination, then the cells won't be able to pass through that glass bead filter. If there's not agglutination, they can. So pretty much looks the same. These are both very useful techniques. They can be performed manually and in the automated fashion, um, and they can do a range of different tests on them. We're going to move on to solid phase technology. If you haven't used this technology before, it can be a bit complicated because it's so different to the other ones. So when I'm talking here, I'm going to go through the photograph on the screen because I personally think that's the easiest way to explain what happened. So what you have in solid phase technology is you have plates filled with U-wells. We're just going to call them wells. Um, these plates, similar to how the cards will have reagents already in them. Some of them won't, but a lot of them do. So if we go through the picture, you can see at the beginning you've got a well and it's coated with antigens and they're fixed to the inside of that well. You then add LIS, which is a low isotonic solution, um, and the patient's plasma. The LIS just reduces the distance between the antigens and antibodies so it's easier for them to bind. This will then be incubated. You can see in this picture, it might look a bit small, but you can, in the image furthest to the left, you've got lots of antibodies that are denoted by the Y shapes that are attached to the antigens. So that would be a positive reaction. Um, in the middle, it's more of a wishy-washy reaction and to the right, none of them have bound. But as you can see here, they're still present. So this technology differs to the column agglutination technology because we then have to wash away any of the antibodies that aren't bound. This is important because if you didn't do this, you could end up with false positive results. So once that's been washed and incubated, you add an indicator red blood cell. So this is a reagent um, and it's basically how we can tell whether or not it's positive. So this will then have antigens on it that will bind to that antibody that's bound to the original antigen. So it's kind of like a antibody sandwich. Um, if there is a positive reaction, this will then be spread out across the well. If it's weakly positive, then it'll be partially spread out, but not all the way. And if it's negative, it will form a little button at the bottom because all of the red cells sort of drop 
to the small bottom. They can't stay along the outside of that well. This is an example of what a negative and a positive result looks like. So you can see that the negative result has that small little button in it and the positive result is that sort of like red wishy-washy colour. It's important to note this because when we go into the hemagglutination technology, it's kind of the opposite to what you would expect the results to be. So it can be very confusing when you first start out. The other thing to note is that this is a technique that cannot be performed manually. It's also a technique that you can have a lot of reagent based issues with. Because you've got a whole plate full of samples, it's very easy to get spillages if you're not careful with it. So you can end up with contaminated results. If you were to have a hemolyzed sample, it would look like a positive result. However, it is a very sensitive technology. So we'll pick up on antibodies like the kid antibodies that some other technologies aren't as good at picking up on. Finally, we're going to move on to hemagglutination or tube grouping. So this is a only a manual technique. It can't be done in an automated fashion. Um, what happens is you use red blood cells, whether that's reagent or patient red blood cells, um, with an equal amount of serum, again, patient or reagent. They're added to a tube. They're incubated at room temperature and then you spin these down. Once they've been spun down, you gently agitate them to see whether or not the red cells have agglutinated and are tightly together or whether they haven't. So you can see in this image that if you've got a strong agglutination, when you agitate that, they're not going to break apart. If you've got a weaker agglutination, then they slowly get more and more broken apart, but you should still be able to see clumps. It's very important to note that even in the OnePlus, there are still clumps of red cells present. If there's no reaction, then it will break apart really easily and you will end up with just a red solution. So you can see why the positive result here is so similar to the negative result here and how that could cause confusion. With the tube grouping techniques, it can have a lot of variables change with it. So it can be very useful if you want to incubate it in the fridge so that you can get more of the cold antibodies present, you can do that. If you want to warm it up, it's easy to warm it up. If you need to change the amount of reagents, it's a technology that can be easily changed when needed. So now we've discussed the four technologies. If you can try and get the worksheets off of QPulse and go through them, the first part of the worksheet is interpretation, so it's got some example results from each of the above technologies. And the second part is just for you to see if you can come up with any pros and cons of those technologies that we've already discussed. So if you pause the video now. OK, so now we're going to work, move on and we're going to go through the results and what they should be. So we're going to start with a tube group. This was the photo that you got on your worksheet. You can see that the A is strongly positive, the B is negative, the AB is positive, a bit more weakly, the D is positive, the A cells are negative and the B cells are positive. So this is an A positive patient. Next we're going to move on to the column agglutination technology. This one is a baby card, so it's not got a reverse group on it, but they're a B negative. So again, the A is negative, the B is strongly positive, the AB is strongly positive, and the D is negative. Finally, we're going to go through the solid phase. This is an O positive patient, so you can see why this could be confusing. Um, the anti-A and the anti-B are negative. The D, A1 cells and B cells are all positive. Now we've gone through that, we're just going to go through some of the pros and cons that I could come up with. I'm going to start with solid phase technology. It can be automated, it has a good detection of antibodies and it's got well-defined endpoints. So you can, you know exactly how long things should be incubated for, how long they should be spun for. There's no variance there. 
However, it's prone to contamination due to spillages. There's problems with interpretation. So if you were to get a dual population here, you would not be able to tell that it's a dual population. It would just look really weird. It can be oversensitive. So because it is so sensitive with its antibodies, you can quite often get positive results that aren't actually indicative of any clinically significant antibodies. However, due to the risks of them being a antibody to a low incident antigen, we wouldn't be able to electronic issue them. They would have to be a full cross match. So it can create more work for you. It would require two technologies in the lab. Because you can't do it manually, you'd have to have a second technology to do the cross matching in, unless you're using the analyzer to do all the cross matching for you. Even then, you'd have to have some form of contingency if you couldn't use the analyzer. So it would require extra training for everyone, extra reagents. You have to be careful when using the plates that have antigens bound to the bottom of them because they can dry out quite easily. And you normally have to batch samples because you'll have more than one sample on each plate. So if you have an urgent sample, you either have to batch it up, which obviously extends testing time, or waste reagent. So it can become quite costly. And if you've got people leaving resealable bags open, again, you can end up having to throw a lot of stuff away. Finally, it's confusing because it looks the opposite of what you would expect if you've been taught tube grouping. I'm going to batch the um, gel column and glass bead technology together because their pros and cons are pretty similar. It can both be automated and manual. You don't have to wash any cells. You can see things like dual population. However, you still can't test humanized samples. And the cards can be dropped and damaged. Also, although they have foil over the top of them, if this is pulled back by mistake, again, you end up wasting cards. And because you have a card preset with what tests you want to do, and you can end up with wasting reagents. Not as often because the cards have been designed specifically to be the most useful, but it does happen. Finally, hemagglutination or tube grouping. It's easy to incubate, it's quick, and it's easy to manipulate. Um, it's only manually. It can't, it requires skill in the interpretation. Again, if you have a humanized sample, it can be different, difficult to interpret. And so you have to have someone that's confident in manual techniques to be able to do it quickly if needed. So you can see that all of these technologies have pros and cons to them. And it's important that you bear the cons in mind when you are doing testing so that you're aware of where things can go wrong. Thank you all for listening to the CPD talk. I hope that you enjoyed it. Again, if you have any feedback or questions, please feel free to email me. Uh, you can leave a comment on this video, but I cannot guarantee that I will get back to it quickly because it depends on how often I end up checking. Thank you for listening. Bye.